Peter Costello was Federal Treasurer uh, from March 1996 to November 2007. And it's important to note that when Peter became Treasurer, uh, he inherited high levels of debt, high levels of deficit, uh, not to mention a significantly downgraded credit rating, as well as very high unemployment. During his 12-year tenure, uh, Peter embarked on a wide range of reforms, most notably in the taxation and the financial sectors. He also crucially balanced the budgets, paid off the debt, uh, and brought unemployment down to 3.9%. And he did all of this before the surge in minerals investments. That's an important point. A lot of people say that Peter Costello spent the rewards of the commodity booms. He actually did a lot of this uh, before the surge in minerals investments. And this helps explain why Australia weathered the global financial storm in 2007, 2008, 2009. Uh, and it's for these reasons that the likes of Paul Krugman, a well-known left liberal economist at the New York Times. He's the doyen of academic Keynesianism at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Even Krugman said that Australia under Costello's treasurership was the miracle economy of the world. And I think this history is important because Peter only did one media interview last week. That was on Monday on the ABC 730 program. And Peter highlighted the perils of what? Higher debt. And uh, this is debt, of course, that governments of both persuasions have accumulated during the course of the last decade. In more recent times, Peter's been chairman of the World Bank's Independent Advisory Board, of the Future Fund, of the Channel 9 Network, of the ECG Advisory Solutions. He's also author of the best-selling Costello memoirs. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Costello. <laughs> and... And to kickstart proceedings, let me introduce my colleague, Simon Cowan, who's Head of Research here at Centre for Independent Studies. Simon. <laughs> and I'll, I'll now leave it over to Simon, and uh, we'll get the ball rolling. Over to you, Simon. Excellent. Thank you very much for coming, and Peter, thank you very much for your time. Um, as Tom said, you delivered 12 budgets. It's been 11 budgets since the last one you delivered. What do you, how do you rate the budget that was delivered Tuesday night in those 11? Well, I think the good thing about the budget on uh, Tuesday night is um, we are now within sight of a balanced budget again. The, um, we've had 10 deficits. Uh, the budget that was handed down is saying we'll have another in the forthcoming year, which is um, starting on the 1st of July 2018. Uh, but then after that, we should balance. And I think that's credible. I think that's, I think that's believable. Um, you know, when it comes to balancing a budget, many promise but few deliver. Uh, you might recall Wayne Swan said he was going to introduce four surplus budgets. In fact, he, he stood up uh, in the House of Representatives and said, the four surpluses I introduced tonight. I said afterwards it was one of the greatest stand-up comedy lines that the House <laughs> of Representatives has ever heard. Uh, and, of course, none of them materialised. So uh, we have had um, 10 deficits. Um, we'll have another this year, although, you know, we're getting within sight of a balanced budget and uh, uh, we should at least get back to a position within, uh, within the year after that where we're not running up debt anymore. And then, of course, the, the, p the task becomes to pay it back. Yes, and you were talking last <coughs> Monday night about exactly that, that challenge. I mean, we've... Net debt is... It, you know, 360, it's expected to go down, but that's a huge sum of money to pay back. Um, in, in terms of where Scott Morrison goes next, what do you think the priorities are for paying back that debt? Or do you still believe uh, that, you know, we won't see that paid back in our lifetime? Well, you see, um, let, let me just try and simplify these concepts as much as possible, because I don't think they're well, well understood um, by the public um, and probably just as badly understood by the media. Um, every year the government raises money and it spends money. If it spends more than it raises, that's called a deficit. It has to finance that deficit. So it borrows the money. 
And if it does the same next year, it borrows a bit more. If it does the same next year, it borrows a bit more. It, the debt never goes away. That's, that's like the balance sheet. And uh, as you said, uh, by running 10 deficits in a row, we've now borrowed in net terms around $370 billion. It's just a liability. We just have to service that. We have to pay interest on that uh, year after year. Now, uh, to do something about that, to pay that down, you've, you've got to reverse the process. You've got to spend less than you raise. That's called a surplus. For money left over, you can pay off a little bit of the debt. And the next year, if you do the same thing, you can pay off a bit more. And um, over the uh, 12 years that, um, that I was uh, in office, by doing 10 surplus budgets, we were able to pay off our debt. The debt, the debt as a proportion of the economy is about the same when I became Treasurer as it is today. 10 surplus budgets, we paid it all off. 10 deficits, we've borrowed it all back. <coughs> right? we're, we're basically back where we were. Now, the critical uh, question is, um, are we going to be able to pay that off again? Um, can we get back to where we were in 2008? And it will take, uh, you know, as I said, it took us 10 surplus budgets to do it last time. It'll probably take 10 to do it again. Um, and you've got to ask yourself this question. I mean, does this country have the appetite? to run surplus budgets for a decade? Does it have the appetite? Does, do our politicians have the appetite? You see, what, one of the terrible things I think is a lot of politicians today would say, well, why should we pay it off? You paid it off, Costello, and what do they do? Just borrow it all again. So why should we pay it off? Um, you know, uh, we'll, 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 we'll go out of office and they'll just borrow it all again. So, you know, what, why, why bother? Um, you know, as I used to say, that the, the trouble with the coalition is the coalition, like economic managers, their job is to come in to fix things. And as soon as things get fixed, right, the public thinks, oh, we'll vote Labor and, and we'll make some whoopee. We'll, 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 we'll go out and have some fun again. And uh, if we ever need things to be fixed up, well, we can get the coalition back and, uh, and I'll do something about it. So, so you know, do, do we have the will to um, do something about it? Will the public stay with you through a decade? Of, uh, of surplus budgets. Now, what's the consequence if we don't? Well, the consequence if we don't is we'll just be more exposed when we go into the next financial downturn. The good thing about 2008, when we went into uh, that financial crisis, we had no debt. We had a AAA credit rate. Our banks were well capitalised. We were a better place than anybody else in the world. But if we were going into that same thing again in today's position, we'd be more exposed. Would we do as well? Um, you go in carrying debt, you come out carrying a lot more. So um, these, are, these are the big structural things that I think the country's uh, got to come to terms with and we've got to think about and uh, uh, we've got to decide whether or not we can, uh, we can handle them. Uh, you said that politicians need, do they have the will to do this? I mean, the coalition government was elected in 2013 on the back of a, a, a debt and deficit disaster. Um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, they, they've maybe got the deficit under control, but the debt's roughly doubled in the time they've been in office. Does that mean that they've failed their own test? Well, you see, you, you know, the coalition, um, rightly in my view, made a lot of um, debt and deficit. We came up to the 2014 budget. This is the uh, Abbott hockey budget, and they, they, they had a red-hot go about doing something about it, but politically lost the argument. And having, having lost that argument, uh, it w didn't prove to be the turning point that uh, people would have hoped for. Um, so since then, the approach has been to take a more mild position, <coughs> you know, not to go for the expenditure cuts so much, but to uh, let the tax revenues grow and try and balance the budget more on the revenue side uh, than on the expenses side. Uh, now, one of the, the best things about this budget, I think, is um, Scott Morrison announced that we'll cap tax in proportion to the economy. 
cap it. Cap it at 23.9%. We don't want tax as a proportion of the economy to go above that. That's a very good point. Uh, and it's a very, uh, you know, I, I, I'd hoped that would be bipartisan, by the way. When, uh, when Labor was in office, they said they were going to cap it. So I thought, well, that's great. You know, we've got two sides of politics. Well, now Labor's in opposition, not as committed to capping uh, tax to uh, GDP as it was. So I think that's a great step forward. Um, what I'd also like to see is some bipartisan agreement on capping expenses. Right? You know, you, 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 you go home and talk to the people in your house and say, well, I'm going to cap my income. I'm not going to earn any more than this next year. What are you going to do about expenses? Oh, well, we'll, we'll spend as much as we want. It's, it, it's not going to work. You know, in most budgets, you actually start by capping expenses first. Right? So I would argue, uh, having decided to cap revenue, good. Uh, what we should try and do is get some agreement about capping expenses. And then if our revenue and our expenses are the same, right, we won't be running a deficit, we won't be building up debt. Hopefully we'll get to a position where our expenses are less than our revenue, we create a surplus, we start paying it back. Well, in this budget though, the coalition increases expenditure as a percent of GDP by 0.3%. The budget is balanced largely on the back of an additional $100 billion of revenue between 2016 and 2020. Uh, is that the kind of economic management, the kind of economic management that will see us pay back the debt? Well, y the good thing is we're going to cap tax. So, w by the way, when you say you, you're going to cap something to GDP, it, it doesn't mean you're not going to raise more. You are, in fact, going to raise more. You're just going to raise it in proportion to the economy. So the proportion stays the same, right? So, yes, you will raise more, even with this cap. The good thing about this cap is you won't raise more than more, um, if you're with me. Uh, so, um, that's the first point. Uh, there is a cap in there, at least under the coalition. Um, the second point is that the government has laid out a plan to move the thresholds, the tax thresholds, and eventually the rates out to 2024. Now, I, I think that's a good plan, a very good plan. The, the trouble is, you know, 2024. Um, will, will, will this government be there in 2024? Um, you know, if you announce a tax plan through to 2024, you, 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 you've got to get home in two more elections to actually deliver it. Uh, and, um, you know, nobody can control the political cycle. So, you know, I think we're on the right path, but, but you know, now it becomes a political issue, doesn't it? Um, you know, can you, can you stay there long enough to actually deliver it uh, in, uh, in 2024? And, you know, the other thing you've got to think about is, what will the state of the economy be like, be like in 2024? Anybody here know? Um, what will it be? Somebody want to tell me what iron ore prices will be in 2024? Because if, 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 if you know, tell me, because I'll go and buy some futures contracts and make an absolute killing. Um, uh, the point is that nobody really knows. So uh, all we can do is, um, is, you know, do our best looking forward uh, and, uh, and hope that we're still there to... Um, to actually see the, the proceeds, the fruits of our labour. This time last week, you laid out a challenge to Scott Morrison in relation to tax cuts, specifically um, talking about people earning $100,000 or more. Uh, that was a key sticking point, I think, in, in Bill Shorten's uh, budget reply. Firstly, do you think the Coalition met the challenge that you gave them? And secondly, do you think that there's any realistic chance in the current political environment that we're going to see tax relief up the, the income scales? Well, see, this is, this is, this is, the, this is the, the real problem about managing a tax system. Every time you lay out a plan, or I've done it, and I'll come back to what I did in a moment, you lay out a plan to get a logical, coherent income tax scale. You're always at risk that some political opportunist will come along and say, I'll do this bit, which affects more people, but I won't do that bit, which affects higher income earners. Now, year after year after year, that's been done. 
Now, the consequence of that is that year after year after year, the burden has been lessened somewhat down the income tax scale and increased commensurately up the income tax scale. Um, in 2007, for example, I laid out a long-term plan for thresholds and rates, one of which was to drop the top income tax rate from 45 to 40 cents. Kevin Rudd said, we agree with that, but we'll do that in the second term of the Rudd government. We'll just do the stuff down the scale in the first term. Right? Well, there was a second term of the Rudd government. It, I don't know, it lasted about a month or two <laughs> after, uh, after he came back. Uh, and of course, he never did it. Never did it. Of course, he never did it. Uh, and this is, you see, what Shorten's now trying to do to the government. Uh, you, you've got a low income tax offset, that's for people down the scale. We'll introduce that. And what about increasing the thresholds? At the other end, nah, leave all that. That's 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 only for the rich. And the consequence is that um, more and more we're weighting the collection of tax up the scale, and this is where we become uncompetitive. Um, so I put forward a top uh, threshold for the top rate of tax, one hundred and eighty thousand in two thousand and seven. You go on the top rate of tax at, uh, at one hundred and eighty thousand. That was then. Three and a half times average weekly earnings. That's still the threshold. And you go on it now at 2.2 .2 times average weekly earnings. Um, if you don't index that, as Shorten says, uh, by 2024, you'll go on it at 1.7 times average weekly earnings. Under the government's proposal, if that gets through, you'll go on it at 2.2. Uh, 1.9, sorry. So it's better than 1.7, 1.9. But it'll still be lower than it is today, right? And and it'll be much lower than it was uh, back in 2007, when it's three and a half. So, so let me just give you a point of comparison. You go on the top rate of tax, which is about the same as ours in the United States, at eight times average weekly earnings. You go on the top rate of tax in the UK, which is about the same as ours, at four times average weekly earnings. Um, you know, we, 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 we put uh, people, you know, who we regard as doing all right on a much bigger tax burden because year after year, grabbing the stuff at the bottom level has put more and more weight at the top level. Now, people say, does it, does it matter? Does it matter? Oh, does it matter if you're paying 47 cents in the dollar? Well, I think it does. I mean, as, as, as I say, 47 cents, it's half of what you earn, right? You know, Bill Shorten says it should be 49 cents, incidentally. Um, you know, uh, earn one day for the government, one day for yourself. As I said once, you know, why don't we just make the tax rate 100% and we could give everything we earn to the government. It could give us back housekeeping or an allowance or something which is how things used to work in Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, so I think it matters. And, and the second area, it doesn't matter, I'll tell you this, is um, we are in competition for skills at the upper end, you know, and we have to make sure we're competitive there as well. Um, these are the people uh, that you do want to build and carry your economy. I'm always amazed, you know, when I go up to Hong Kong, how many Australians are living in Hong Kong, young Australians living in Hong Kong. What are you all doing here? But it always comes back to one answer, of course. You know, during, during their high income earning years, they're, they're in Hong Kong. Right? And then when they're ready to sort of draw down on the social welfare system, they're back in Australia. It's, it's you know what? Never see any retire Australian retirees moving to Hong Kong. Never seen that, right? <laughs> I've seen a lot of Australian retirees moving back from Hong Kong to Australia. I've seen uh, a lot of Australians, young Australians, move from Australia up to Hong Kong. All they're doing is, over their lifetime, they're arbitraging. 
During their earning years, they're going to work in low tax jurisdiction. During their drawing years, they're going to live in high tax jurisdiction. Very, very rational. Rational decision uh, for these people to make. Now, all I'm saying is uh, if we could keep our income tax rates more competitive, we'd keep more of those people here, which I want. I'm, I'm a proud Australian. I want them to work here. I want uh, the, uh, you know, the best and the brightest, not to feel they have to go somewhere else, but to be able to stay here. And that's why you've got to stay uh, competitive in your income tax rate as well. So we mentioned retirees. <coughs> One of the focuses the government had in this budget was, was delivering uh, benefits to the baby boomer generation. You were the architect of, I won't say Australia's current re retirement system, but a significant portion of it. Do you feel that we're headed in the right direction on retirement incomes, or, or do you think recent changes have, have shifted the balance in one direction or the other? Well, you know, the point I make about retirement incomes is this. Um, there'll be a group of Australians who will be able to retire and never go on the pension will not draw a dollar of pension from the time they retire, age pension, from the time they retire to, um, to their death. Um, and, and that's actually good. <laughs> we want as many more of them as we can find, frankly. And my view always was you ought to encourage them. Um, you know, the, the, the average life expectancy for a, uh, a man uh, these days is 86. If you're on the pension, it's 65. Um, if, if, if you can get people that don't draw down their pension, that's 21 years of pension the government saves. Um, you know, I'll tell you a funny thing uh, which always gets abused. The, the, the age pension was introduced in 1909. 1909. You get the age pension at 65. You know what life expectancy was in 1909? Average life expectancy? 55. <laughs> right? So you had to beat the average by 10 years to get a pension. I once, uh, I once uh, said to one of my Treasury officers, I said, geez, you know, so they offered a pension at 65 to people who were going to die at 55. And this Treasury officer looked at me and said, yeah, Treasury is on its game in those days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was really on its game in those days. You had to beat the odds, <coughs> right? Now, on average today, you're going to live to 86. So a promise that was made, which on average would apply to nobody, uh, now applies on average for 21 years. Uh, so, so, you know, the more of those people that can fund their own retirement and never draw down on an age pension, the better. Then there's the biggest cohorts, about 80% of Australians who will have some superannuation. And, you know, this, this is a point I think people have got to get in their minds, is that the occupation of superannuation, it doesn't free people from the pension. It's an adjunct to the pension. That's all it is. It's an adjunct. And for many of those people, after they've exhausted their um, occupational, they'll, they'll start off as part pensioners, and after they've exhausted their uh, occupational superannuation, they'll end up as full pensioners. So it's, it's not freeing anybody from the system totally. It might, it might turn you from full pension to part. So, so you don't want to throw off at the 20% that will fund themselves. I think we should be encouraged. We should try and get as many more of them. This is the big time bomb ticking in, in our... Uh, our welfare well, system it's probably going to mature in about 2040 uh, and uh, we've got to be preparing for it that's that's you know i used to introduce these things called intergenerational talks right and the whole idea was to try and tell people this generational time bomb's ticking you better get ready for it uh, i don't want to be in a position in 2040 where the government says oh by the way we can't afford to pay the age pension either this does happen you know, there, there have been various um, states and cities in the United States that have defaulted on their pension obligations. Detroit, for example. 
you know, promised all their firemen and police officers and council workers pensions for life, one problem, couldn't pay them. Uh, and so I want to make sure that if we're, we're holding out to Australians that they will have a retirement income, we're in a position to pay it. Uh, we've got to prepare for it. Be better if we had low debt going into that sort of uh, scenario. This is what I used to call generational economics. Oh, so then are you in favour of increasing the super guarantee to 12%? I might we, just give you that. We're yeah. having some sound problems. Um, well, look, um, you, you know, the Commission of Audit uh, that reported to Abbott and Hockey said that 80% of Australians reliant on pensions. If you increased the SG to 12% and ran it over 40 years, 80% of Australians would be reliant on pensions. Um, they might be... Uh, more part pensioners rather than full pensioners, but it doesn't free you the 12%. You know, you've got to think of 12% on average earnings over 40 years. It's not going to give you enough to fund your retirement outside of the pension. It is essentially a pension supplement. So should we cut it then and allow for more voluntary contribution? Well, I, I'm a great one for voluntary contributions. You know, I, I think once you start interesting people in their own retirement and get them to start making voluntary contributions, you, you've, you know, you... I think one, one of the problems is, you know, you, you do have to get interest people in their own superannuation, uh, which they're, they're not really engaged in at the moment. They're not engaged in it because you turn up at work, someone takes some money out of your, out of your pay packet, sends it off to a fund that you never heard of. You know, if you're a young person, you turn up for another part-time job, they send it off to a different fund. You know, many of these young kids have got three and four and five superannuation accounts. Nothing much in them, but you've got to get people involved and interested in that sort of thing. Well, and I suppose that brings us fairly neatly to the last thing that I want to talk about before we throw it open to questions, and that's um, the, the banking sector, particularly the financial advisors in the banking sector. Um, we've seen a lot come out of the, the Royal Commission. Um, do you feel that, firstly, does that undermine the case for company tax cuts? Well, economically it doesn't, of course. I mean, the, the, the economic case for company tax cuts is we are in a global competition and have to be competitive, right? I understand that argument. And I've put the argument it's not just companies where we're in competition, but for individuals as well. And I've made the point that companies pay 30 cents in the dollar. By the way, individuals are paying 47. So, you know, I've, I've put the case, don't forget about the individuals uh, whilst you're uh, thinking about the companies. Um, but politically, I think, you know, you, you only have to see what's coming out of the Senate now. I mean, politically, uh, it's made it harder. There's no doubt about that. And um, I, uh, I watched Bill Shorten's budget reply uh, where he kept on talking about the coalition plan for uh, tax cuts for big companies and banks. He kept on saying big companies and banks. I, 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 I counted 17 times he said it in a 30-minute speech. He does right? tend to repeat himself from he time to time. He does repeat himself, that's true. But it also tells you they think they're on a bit of a winner there. Um, uh, so, politically, it has made it harder. Uh, it, it hasn't changed the economic case, but it's probably made the political equation uh, more difficult. But having said all of that, well, that may or may not go through the Senate. We don't know. That will depend on a couple of um, independents in the Senate. But um, in the interim, I reckon... Um, we ought to get on with uh, changing the thresholds and the scales for individuals. Uh, what, you do you, what do you? One think? roadblock is another opportunity. <laughs> uh, what do you think is driving some of the behaviour that we've seen in the banks? I mean, you've been a, uh, involved in financial services regulation. You've been involved in financial services more generally for some time. It, the, the prevailing narrative is that this is a problem of misbehaviour amongst the banks and that the regulators aren't to blame. Is that is that correct? Yeah, well, wh when I talk about the banks, I'm talking about the four retail banks, right? Um, who, who uh, you know, are four of either the four biggest or four of the five biggest 
uh, companies by market cap on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, and here's, here's a point that fascinates me. In 2008, in that financial crisis, the Australian banks were the best performed in the world. Didn't require a bailout. Didn't make one annual loss. None of those banks even made one quarterly loss. In fact, there was a time there where I think of something like 10 AA rated banks in the world, four of them were Australian. So, come through the financial crisis, nobody misses a beat, brilliantly performed financial sector. Fast forward, um, or as a movie director would say, fade. Uh, to 2018, banks are more on the nose than ever, right? I can understand why in the, in the United States people would dislike banks because taxpayers' funds were used to bail them out and in Britain, uh, but not in Australia. So, so why is this? Why after, you know, the great sort of test they pass swimmingly well, why, why is it 10 years later they're on the nose? Well, you know, I think perhaps the seeds of what happened lay in that great success of 2008. You know, uh, banks began to think that uh, they were pretty impregnable, they'd come through this great crisis, you know, that they could uh, generate record profit year after year, that, um, uh, they looked around the world, they compared their salaries to global salaries, they thought they should be a bit higher uh, and took their eye off, um, off the consumer. Um, and here's where we are in 2018. But to answer your question, I'll make one other point. It's all very well to say, um, oh well the banks didn't obey the law and they should be investigated and prosecuted. You've got to remember all the way through, banking is a very highly regulated industry in this country. Very, very highly regulated. I, I know because I put a lot of that regulation in place. Um, we, we, we had a corporate regulator all the way through here. And if you want to say that uh, the banks were misbehaving, I want to ask where the corporate regulator was. And I hope by the time we get to uh, the end of this Royal Commission, the Commissioner asked that question as well. Uh, I'm not excusing bad behaviour, but I also want to know that our regulators were on the job uh, because they had responsibility uh, here as well. Uh, so, you know, let's see where the uh, Royal Commission comes out. The one thing I would plead uh, with the Commissioner, not my job to plead with him, but I would, would hope doesn't come out of the Royal Commission is some, some new regulatory system like breaking up the banks or uh, ordering some kind of divestment um, because uh, we have had great prudential strength and stability. That's the one good thing. Uh, we had through the financial crisis and I'd hate to do anything uh, that would affect stability and strength. I, when I was Treasurer I used to say uh, uh, to the press, you know, whenever they sort of got worked up about uh, bank profits, I'd say, oh yes, those bank profits are terrible. I said, do you know there's only one thing worse than a bank that's profitable? That's a bank that's making a loss. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a big problem, right? <laughs> Uh, and we don't, we certainly uh, don't want to go down that path uh, coming out of this Royal Commission. Excellent. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you all have um, a, a multitude of questions for Peter. Is anyone willing to volunteer? We have one down the front now. We've got a mic coming, so. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for those thought provoking and very direct comments. Um, I wanted to ask you about expenditures. So you're saying, you know, as a country, we've racked up too much debt, we're not running surpluses on the budget, but we still should not tax more corporates and individuals. 
So where is, at, at aged pensions, we've got to keep funding an aging population. Where are we spending too much or not productively and, you know, where should we tighten our belts? I'd, I'd, I'd make two points about this. Um, I always used to say when I was treasurer, um, the, the easiest cut was the money you didn't spend in the first place. That is, the new program you didn't introduce would save you a whole lot of money, um, but no one would feel something was being taken away from them. Right? And what we have to be extremely careful about is open-ended demand-driven programs. You, 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 you think back at the big expenditures uh, of this country Medicare was an open-ended, demand-driven program and, you know, the government's tried to keep the costs down essentially by not indexing the benefits back to the doctors and getting the doctors to, um, you know, charge a gap, which many of them now do. Um, tertiary education was an unfunded, demand-driven program. The government spent years trying to get students to try and make a contribution, uh, which it now does with its um, health program. The NDIS will be a huge um, demand-driven, unfunded program. We, we really don't know what that's going to cost because that's not coming um, into effect until um, 2020. Um, the uh, Shorten wants to uncap tertiary places. Uh, this will be, um, again, a demand-driven program um, which, which will put the Commonwealth into spending more money. So. Th these are the big expenditures and um, you've got to do it by sort of capping demand, by getting co-contributions. Um, you know, when I was the Treasurer, uh, the age pension was 25% of male average weekly earnings. Rudd put it to 27.7. may not sound a big thing, but 2.7%. As it balloons out, decade after decade, becomes very significant. You you know, I mean, the most important thing in any any product is is, is the inflator or the multiplier, right? You know that. And uh, uh, this is the thing in these Commonwealth demand-driven programs. If you have generous inflators and uh, multipliers, it doesn't look they give you a four-year costing. It doesn't look that much, but it's compounding. Five, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen, twenty years. <coughs> it becomes extremely expensive. Mm, Childcare is another Child obvious care. example. Who else have we? Yep, um, Jess. Uh, yep. Yep. Jessica Irvine, Sydney Morning Herald. Can I take you to the specifics of the seven-year tax plan that the government did announce? which sort of delayed what you were talking about, changing thresholds and providing relief for those forgotten high income earners to the sort of the back three years and the first four years you get a new low and middle income tax offset, which Ken Henry, when he looked at the tax system, he said that's about the worst thing you can do is have these tax offsets. We've added another one, um, which sort of doesn't constitute long term tax reform in that it expires after four years. What do you think of that? as a good policy? Well, you see, w we had a thing called the LIHTO, the Low Income Tax Offset. And from memory, that got introduced at the insistence of the Australian Democrats after the 93 budget. And the government's now going to have the LIMINTO, the Low and Middle Income Tax <laughs> Offset. And then... Um, Shorten says, that's all right, I'll see you on the Lamento and I'll raise you to the WITO, the Working Australians Tax Offset. So he, <laughs> he would now have three tax offsets uh, in there. Of course, no Australian have a clue what any of these offsets are uh, because of the, the complexity, so the tax office calculates it for you. So uh, he's adding another layer of complexity. The, the trouble, you know, this is very technical tax jargon, but the trouble is, as you know, with these offsets is they do phase out and when they phase out, they actually add to the, what's called the effective marginal tax rate, the EMTR. Um, but 
uh, and, and that is a way of delivering um, uh, benefits early, which I support, to um, hard-pressed low- and middle-income earners. Um, the, the, the more serious stuff, I think, is the second part of the plan, which is the thresholds and the rates. That if you could get a 30% a, a rate in there between uh, 40000 and 200000 that is really good tax reform. Uh, and, and that's the kind of thing that we really, we really want. Um, but the trouble is, as I said, you know, that's the plan for 2024 and you've got to survive two elections to, to get it. Even if you legislated it now, you see if there's a change of government, it can be taken out. This is the problem. Um, so so that, that is good tax reform. Um, lower rates, less thresholds, that is very good tax reform. There's no doubt about that in a design sense. Uh, it's just that uh, there's a couple of contingencies before you get there. But, but I suppose it's worth just following up on, on Jess's point. Uh, there's going to be 10 effective uh, tax thresholds between the two offsets and the income tax, the Medicare levy surcharge, the Medicare levy phase in and phase out. Um, why is it that the government has delayed this, the main part of their tax reform to 2024, given that they have a lot of additional revenue now? Well, obviously, they wanted to deliver the benefits to the low and middle income earners immediately. That's obvious. That's what they said that. Um, and obviously, you know, you're going into an election year. Uh, the government, you know, wanted to be able to deliver something um, to people uh, before before the election. Well, it doesn't really quite get there before the election, but it, but at least, uh, you know, in the short term. And Shorten says, yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll see you and I'll raise you, he says, uh, in relation to that. Well, you know, this is a democratic country, you have elections. Um, but the longer term uh, reform is, is good, you know, and particularly that 40,000 to 200,000. I mean, Shorten says, oh, that's unfair because a nurse would pay the same tax as a CEO. The nurse wouldn't pay the same tax as a CEO would pay the same tax rate as a CEO. You know, 30% of 40,000 is not nearly as much tax as 30% of 200,000. Right? Right? Um, and by the way, if that's so unfair, I can't understand it. You know, why do all companies pay the same rate? Uh, you know, the, the bank pays the same rate, 30 cents, uh, leaving aside the changes that are going through at the moment, uh, as a middle, uh, which I don't know where they'll end up, as a, as, a, as a middle company does. You know, but but the good thing about that is as the nurse becomes head of a ward, maybe head of a hospital, maybe director of nursing, as that nurse wage goes up, of course the nurse will pay more tax, but it'll pay at the same rate. Uh, that the rates won't start uh, um, eating into her incentives or his incentives uh, because I'm not going to be sexist about nurses <laughs> or his incentives. Jeff? Sorry, I've got a microphone coming behind you. All right. Do you think there's scope for uh, longer term reform, reforming federal state relationships so that we don't have duplication of function and, oh. and double voting vote buying that we seem to be yeah. pervasive at the moment. Well, you know something, I mean, when I first became treasurer, the Commonwealth would make an offer to the states about how much money they'd get. And it would be famously put under their hotel doors the night before, <laughs> the what they were going to get. And the states always said, we don't have any planning, we don't know what's happening. So I came up with this brilliant idea. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> we'll, we'll introduce a GST and we'll give that to the states. It'll grow in proportion to the economy and they'll have absolute certainty and then they can take responsibility. Well, of course, they took the 10% GST but they never changed the script. The script still was, we haven't got enough money from the Commonwealth. <laughs> You know, you had this growing tax base who still didn't have enough money from the Commonwealth. Now, I'll make this point to you. This is an interesting point. Think about this for a moment. Mostly the states are in surplus. New South Wales, Victoria. 
is a Commonwealth that's in deficit. And yet, every state premier is still reading from the same script. We haven't got enough money. We need mon more money from Canberra. So let me, let me get this right. You've got more money than you're spending and you want to spend more, so you've got to go to a, a government that's in deficit <laughs> to give you that money. The states are in a very strong financial position. Eh? And I hope the journalists listen to it carefully here. The one government that never indexes its thresholds, a state government, never index their thresholds on properties. This has been the biggest bracket creep that Australia has ever seen as property markets have gone like that and the states are still charging stamp duty uh, at thresholds that were probably set in about the 1960s or the 1970s. And that's largely why they're now in surplus, property booms. Uh, New South Wales and Victoria. So, <laughs> you know something, Jeff? I'll just say to you, this, this old script, every time there's a problem, it's Canberra's fault. It's just too hard to change. It's just, I don't know, they must, they must read it to state politicians in their cribs or something. You know? <laughs> it, just, it doesn't sort of really matter what happens. And, and the Commonwealth's dumb enough, in my view, to get sucked into all these new areas. It's dumb enough to get sucked into them. So, so what do we see now? Well, the Commonwealth's getting more and more sucked into school funding. Run by the state. Um, NDIS is essentially, you know, the Commonwealth taking over a lot more responsibility in the disability area, which the states <coughs> used to have. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're repeating the mantra they've heard in the crib and the Commonwealth dumb enough to fall for it. Um, and that's why, do you, I think there's a real possibility. Um, I don't think it'll be, I don't think I'll be around to see it. <laughs> We've got time for one or two more questions. One down the <coughs> front here. And then one up the back. Uh, Andrew Stone. Um, I, I just wanted to take issue with a, a couple of the points you made about the 23.9% of GDP tax cap and also the government's tax plan, because you, you seem to say there, there was a considerable amount that was praiseworthy about those. Could I put a co contrary view to you that they're a sign of fundamental unseriousness? So to take the 23.9% of GDP tax cap, I guess it's nice to have some sort of cap, but uh, for people who don't know where that figure comes from, that's the average of the tax take for G, uh, uh, to GDP for the years 2000, 2001 on to 2007, 08. So it's after the GST through to the um, global financial crisis, which happened to be a period of relatively very strong revenue collections. Now your government did well because they were actually using those to pay down debt. But nevertheless, it was a very unrepresentative period. If you took the average throughout through from the GST to now, the average would be 22.5% of GDP. That's about a one and a half percentage point of GDP difference, which is about $25 billion a year. So the government is effectively saying, trust us, we're, we're don't going to be low tax government. We're going to keep the tax take no more than $25 billion a year above average for this period. Uh, as a result, they're not actually expecting to get anywhere near that cap uh, for some time. Likewise with their tax plan through to 2024. There seems to have been a tendency of governments ever since the Rudd government to spend a lot of time promising what's going to be happening in 10 or 30 or 50 years' time and not worrying about what they're going to do in the next term. And we've seen this with this current government as well, their company tax plan that wasn't to really come in to any significant degree to fruition for 10 years. Now this one that's not to come to fruition for seven years. Isn't that a sign of a government that's actually not really doing anything? <laughs> I know I'd, I'd be interested to know, for example, if you can recall anything which your government did where you were making major promises about things that were going to be happening in two or three or four elections time. And given that, isn't the core problem at the moment, to go back to the tax issue, that fundamentally if the government won't cut spending, that's why they're having to leave tax so high. And there's no clear reason why I should take seriously promises of tax cuts in seven years' time. Yeah, well, look, I, I largely agree with you. Your point is 23.9 uh, might be too high. I mean, all I'd say to you is I'll take 23.9 because I don't think the alternative to 23.9 will be 22.9. I think it's more likely to be 24 or 25, you know. So, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take it where I can find it uh, and, you know, down the track we can talk them into reducing it. Well and good, but, you know, let's, let's sort of crawl before we can walk. That would be my sort of attitude to that. Um, 
on the uh, on the ten year forecast, you know, we we used to do a budget for one year, and that wasn't all that accurate. And then we started doing them for four years, and wasn't any more accurate. And because that four year wasn't accurate, they decided to start doing them for ten years. <laughs> and uh, you know, this is a thing that old Swanee uh, used to produce because things were going so bad, he'd say, don't worry about it, you know. Ten years, they'll all be better. And um, anybody who knew anything knew Swanee wasn't going to be there in ten years' time. <laughs> uh, so I, he, he produced a chart to show that by 2018, now, we'd have zero debt. That was his first ten-year chart. Zero. We miss him, the old Swanee, don't we? <laughs> um, so, the way you've got to look at these 10-year forecasts is, look, if the economy were to grow continuously for 10 years and it were to grow continuously at 3%, that's what the outcome... And there were no changes in the economy. That's what the outcome would be. But we all know that's not going to happen. So... It's 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 indicative. It's indicative. I, I you know, I I I'm not even sure whether the, you know, the budget year is all that accurate. I mean, the only thing you really can trust is a budget outcome, actually, right? Because that's actually been delivered. That's that's what we actually know happened. Even a budget year um, is is uh, is full of full of assumptions. So. Look, it's interesting, you know, having these 10-year projections, but they're only as good as the projections. And, you know, the one thing we do know, this is what we do know, is the economy will not grow at 3% per annum for 10 years. We know that won't happen. Uh, some years it might grow a lot more, some years it might grow a lot less. The thing that worries me is this. You know, we are in our 27th year of expansion, you know, and y you're doing a 10-year... Assumption of 3% per annum for 10 years, what do you think? We're going to have 37 years of continuous expansion? Well, that would be, uh, that would be unprecedented, I think, anywhere in the globe uh, for the last 200 years. So uh, whatever's going to happen, it's, uh, it's not going to be that. So just you make a good point, which is, you know, just bear a dose of reality when you're looking at all these things. Um, it's always good when you're dealing with Canberra. And one last one up the back. Oh, hi, Joanna Mather from the Australian Financial Review. Can I ask you one backwards and one forwards looking question by any chance? The backwards one is, if you had your time over again, would you make franking credits refundable? And the other is, um, uh, the Royal Commission looks like it's going to have a good hard look at grandfathered commissions and you see ASIC would like to see those banned because, you know, this is, this is all the, the commissions that sort of happened before FOFA. I wondered, what do you reckon about that? So the last point again, the, the do banning... You, yeah, uh, grandfathered commissions. Uh, this is... Uh, be banned. Yeah, so this is what no ASIC reckons commission. should happen out of the Royal Commission. I don't know. Um, <coughs> well, without getting into the technical detail of that, I, th I think the reality is that commissions are going to be banned. And... Those people that are working in that industry will have to adjust to a new model. Um, you know, you, some, some of the people who have been around for a long time might be able to keep it for a while, but it's, it's going to come to an end and, and it's going to become a fee-for-service model. And, you know, this is where I think these big financial houses are going to have to think they're real, their model. You know, it may not just be that there's been some scandals, it may be that the whole model is now under pressure. Uh, and that's what they're going to have to think about. And you notice, for example, the banks are now getting out of this business. Um, and I think, you know, they want to limit their liability and they're not sure that it's going to be um, the money spinner that it used to be. Um, yes, would I introduce refundable, uh, free funding of Franklin Credit? Yes, yes, of course I would. Um, you've got to remember, before I introduce that, for example, charities couldn't get refunded. 
The Labor says it's going to go back to the pre-system, oh, except for charities. Uh, not-for-profits couldn't get it. Labor's going to go back to the old system, except for not-for-profits. Uh, pensioners couldn't get it. Labor's going to go back to the old system, except for pensioners. Right? So the, 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 their carve-outs are sort of, you know, coming uh, bit by bit, which I welcome, by the way. I welcome them. You know, when they announced it, by the way, they weren't going to carve out all of these people. So what's the theory behind it? Let's just think about the theory behind this. The theory behind all of this is that tax in a company is essentially a withholding tax. And by the time it goes to an individual, you just go up or down to your marginal rate with that credit. Nice, simple, right. Because at the end of the day, people, one way or another, through a pension fund, through a super fund, through an individual, people own companies. You know, one way or another. And so the dividend should be uh, 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 shored up to the marginal rate, one way or another. And that's good, that's simple. And the more you deny that, you know, the more you walk away from that principle, point one, point two, the more you sort of open these opportunities for arbitrage. Uh, people who can get franking credits trying to get their hands on the franking credits of people who can't get them, right? And, 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 and you get these very, very complicated trades, very, very complicated anti-avoidance rules. You know, I, I keep coming back to this point, which I always thought was important in tax. You know, simplicity is a goal in taxation. It is actually a goal. You know, raising revenue is important. That's number one. Number two, raising it in a way that doesn't damage your economy because some taxes are worse than others. Number three, simplicity so that people know what the law is and can comply with it. And, you know, all of these rules, all of these grandfathering rules, some people getting frank and credit, some not, very complex. You know, you get, you get big transactional costs, you get avoidance mechanisms, you know, and you, you complicate your tax system. And the consequence of all of that is it's a worse tax system. And, you know, I said the other day, I don't... Uh, you know, in one, one part of me feels sorry for these financial advisors. You know, everyone says, oh, they gave advice to do this, they gave advice to that. Look, I'd never be a financial advisor. It's too complicated for me. And, you know, I know quite a bit about the tax system, right? But, but I, I wouldn't trust myself, you know, to get for every single person the optimal tax treatment that will help them with their superannuation and their equities and their fixed interest and their everything else, you know. I'm smart enough to sort of save myself that potential liability. And, and, and the complexity of all of this now, the complexity of the superannuation system is, is just so hard. You know, and uh, you know, I'd say you probably know more about it than me, but you, you know, would our financial journalists who write about this every day set themselves up as financial advisors and, and take money from people and tell them how to do it? And, then, of course, something changes and a tax law changes and they look back and they say, you advised me to do this and I've lost all of this money and, you know, I'd like to put you up in a royal commission and, you know, hang your garters off my clothesline and all the rest of it. I mean, the, the complexity of the system, you know, sometimes it's better just to get it simple. And that was a big fight for the GST, of course. They just put it on everything and, and make it 10%. Right? And, and every time you had an exemption in there, something else, you've got complexity. So, so you know, flatter taxes on bigger bases with simplicity. That's, that's the way we ought to go. Um, and I hope we do. Thank you. Peter, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Centre for Independent Studies is very fortunate to have a very distinguished uh, board of directors. I'd like to call on our chairman of the board, Peter Mason. Tom, uh, and particularly Peter and Simon, thank you, Peter. Um, I remember a few years ago you came to the Centre for Independent Studies when we were still over there in the dark rooms of uh, St Leonard's and you gave a wonderful speech about the place of religion in Australian society and uh, the implications of some of the changes there. Um, Peter is a man of, you talk about complexity in our system, 
uh, he's uh, led a life where there's a complexity of interests. So we go, we can traverse religion at one level, we can traverse Australian rules football, where Peter was once the, uh, the, <coughs> the, the premier card holder of, uh, uh, for Essendon, and uh, is still a, was until last Saturday an avid Essendon follower. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, to hear you talk today, um, it's a shame you're not still there, Peter. We've said that to you before. I think in particular you referred to something that, that I certainly miss, and that is intergenerational reports and the look at um, the, the approach of a, of a government towards its obligation to the future. And we don't hear that language used these days in our leadership um, on either side of politics. And I think it is much missed in terms of the way a lot of policy is thought about. It says a lot about uh, what we do in the world at large, that we are very short term in the way we think. And you have been a long term thinker we thank you for that. We thank you for the contribution you've made to this country and we thank you very much for having been with us today and stimulated us um, early on a Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. That's fantastic.